this is a presentation on uh, um, site practice for distributed tracing. It's going to have a, a Zipkin centrism to it because that's where most of our experiences come from. Um, and we're going to leave some time for questions unless we accidentally run through all of it. <laughs> but uh, one of the nice things we have is a, a few folks who have um, you know, been, been in the trenches or are in the trenches now. So uh, let's, let's do some introductions. Um, this, this person I'm talking is uh, Adrian. And uh, F is not explicit. It, uh, it, it's, uh, it's actually my middle name is Forrest. Uh, but uh, some people were thinking that it's like Adrian Effing Cole, um, but it's actually not. Um, the uh, context I'm here is uh, I, I work on the Spring Cloud team at Pivotal. I spend most of my time on Zipkin project, and I've, I think it's my fourth year. Yeah, it is my fourth year at uh, Pivotal, and consequently also fourth, fourth year on the Zipkin project that um, will come up through the presentation. I am Nara. I'm from Netflix, representing uh, Netflix. Like we've done like a lot of tracing work. The runtime team is here, um, Taylor and Asi, and then um, also um, shout out to Agent Sites. There's a lot of people working on tracing. So I'm just representing the the work that uh, we did. So I'm part of the Insight Engineering teams. So I will share my experience of what um, we uh, what I learned from the work I did. Hello, everyone. I'm Tommy. Uh, I also work at Pivotal on the Spring team. And I'm specifically the project lead of Micrometer Metrics Library for JVM applications. And I also am a Zipkin committer, so that's how I tie into tracing world. Cool. So we kind of uh, had, a, had a chat about how we're going to, to uh, do things. And um, I'll, I'll go through some of the um, introductory slides because probably some people here aren't, aren't terribly familiar with distributed tracing. Um, I, I want to make sure that we go through some context setting and that way it's not completely lost. Um, and, uh, and then uh, basically Tommy and Nara are going to have some, some focus point uh, slides. And then um, uh, afterwards we'll, we'll let you all just pick our brains. And, uh, and maybe we can pick yours. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll start the presentation. And then to keep the cameras sane, we'll just like trade places on stage here. So I think one of the questions that, that is ever present is, uh, what, what is distributed tracing anyway? And um, I think that uh, a lot of times people will focus on you know, one of those two words, like, is it mostly interesting because it's distributed, like you have a distributed landscape? Um, or is it the tracing part? Um, it's, it's kind of like both. Um, but it's, it's also important to talk about the, the context things sit. Like distributed tracing, I would say, is arguably mostly about um, production requests. So like, uh, uh, you know, as a, as a cross your system, not necessarily like other types of events, like. Uh, garbage collection or audit events or, or things that are not necessarily um, request scoped. Um, and uh, you know, your architecture may be quite small. So we, we definitely have some folks who choose to use Zipkin even in a monolith, um, which doesn't seem to fit the distributed part. But you know, um, it, it's not required to be distributed, in other words. Um, the, the way things work, at the end of the day, it deals with uh, passing IDs around. And so um, a lot of people may be familiar with a request ID. Uh, even as a user, you may have accidentally found a request ID in a log someplace. And so tra tracing also has a unique ID that's, that's consistent wherever that request goes. And um, this, this is not uh, just useful for the system itself and trying to piece things together. But also this common act that we do, which is you know correlation, um, which which could actually be across different systems like logging and, and such. And one of the kind of you know posits is that the you know viewing something can give you more insight uh, than uh, parsing something. Uh, 
So at the end of the day, everything's parsing, uh, but uh, the idea is that one of the primary outputs here is either is a diagram in nature, whether that's a causal diagram for the request or uh, a service topology uh, or, or something, but it's, it's mainly the calls is a focus word. So um, getting away from um, you know, reliance on things like timestamps uh, to, to tell exactly what calls to what. And I don't think I actually have a, a deep dive on this part, but if you think about it, like in a messaging system, um, it could be quite tricky sometimes to tell the difference between what happened to come after something else and what was actually caused by something that was queued earlier. And so distributed tracing can help um, in asynchronous architectures. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, we'll have links at the end if you want to get your hands dirty on some of this stuff. And you know, I mean, I think sometimes people like it because they think it's neat. They like to see things. Um, and a lot of times when people start with, with tracing, they can, they can see something that wasn't evident to them before. Um, so for example, uh, I don't have a pointer, but you could see a large blue line at the top, or unless you're colorblind, then it's gray. Uh, but there's a, there's a long line at the top there, and that represents um, the, uh, the, the time in the, in the service here, which is a, a large contributor to latency uh, from the client. And, um, and if you were to think in like a parallel mind, then you could think that these steps, each of these bars being steps along the path of this request doing its business, that some of them appear to be happening in parallel or parallel-ish. <laughs> and um, certainly uh, if you were thinking like from, uh, I don't wanna block my clients, maybe this thing could have let go of the top a lot earlier. Um, so maybe, it could have let go the, at the first handoff, that first bar. Um, so one of the things that um, is neat about it is that once you train your eyes on these things, then you can start to see, see behaviors that are hard to explain, but easy to, easy to just um, notice. And, and uh, especially this is one of the things that happens most of the time in, in a news site is they notice something that, that some understanding uh, insight uh, even based on cherry picking requests and looking at them. It's not a strategy though. It just happens to be a nice thing that happens when people first start looking at things in a different way. And so in the case of our, um, our own service, actually that was a Zipkin post request, um, the system that, that you're seeing here, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more later. Um, we, we use it ourselves. Uh, and so we actually were able to take that line all the way back to uh, just this tiny fraction of whatever it is, I don't know if it's a, a millisecond or something for that post to return. Because what we noticed was it actually wasn't blocked until the second bar, because there was some queuing delay, we could actually unblock that request a, he a heck of a lot sooner. And so um, for us, um, in a tracing system, our like main thing we're trying to do is not cause any harm in application architecture. And a, a, a good way to do that is to not block clients. And so we thought that that was do, doing service. And you as your own, um, in your own application site, you're gonna have different value systems for what your services are supposed to do. They're supposed to have consistent latency if they're supposed to not make calls into systems they're not supposed to be calling, like not make deprecated requests or not um, call billable services too often or, or whatever, whatever it is. And so visualizing things can help, help out with that. And this is, this is a sort of the why I care. I'm still in the introduction, by the way. Uh, and uh, these were literally taken from, from people who were running sites and what's the difference between what they thought they'd care about and what they actually cared about. Because a lot of times people think about tracing and they're like, oh, I'm gonna hunt down this long tail latency, the really slowest request and figure out the problem with that. But um, yeah, what we've been told uh, as, a, as a large community is that um, you know, what ends up being the more important thing is about productivity and understanding. So for example, you wanna reduce your time and triage trying to figure out where to, where to put your assets if you're, if you're diagnosing a problem or if you're trying to reduce um, you know, so, some accidental latency, uh, that context helps you, helps you focus. So like instead of blaming the database, <laughs> 
um, you'd actually be able to tell that it in fact was a database or was not, right? Um, and, and that can help, help you focus and reduce that time in triage. The, the other thing is like we, we, we hear the word service a lot, um, but what is, what is service anyway? We, we have uh, service level agreements, we have um, counterparties that, that we need to promise things to or, or, or are making promises to us. And if you look at diagrams that have uh, tiers per service, like, like this one here, if you could imagine each of these bars, you can't see the service name. But if each of these are service calls, you could actually see, like, uh, in a way, as, as you view up and down, what you're, what you're calling for how long and, um, and who's calling it to you. It's better in a topology view. I don't have a slide on that. But, but what I mean to say is that um, it can allow you to uh, have visualizations about um, what type of request you're causing. And if you think of that in a service point of view, that can help you with, with SLA management. Um, most often these days, we're getting you know, extreme ease in deploying complex things. Which, which may not be a good thing, I don't know. <laughs> but like, we, we're definitely getting to the point where uh, it's super easy to enter all sorts of architectural patterns. And it can be surprising what type of communication happens out of the apps. So um, uh, particularly in a asynchronous code, there can be some, some gotchas that people aren't aware of about like the difference between what the request is scheduled to do and when it invokes the thing that it's scheduled to do. And that stuff will show itself. Um, so if you have something that's supposed to be super asynchronous, and then you look and it's like making calls like this, then, then you know you have something to look into because it's like racing stripes on a Honda. No offense, Honda. Um, so anyway, the other thing is, and I think what is a, is a huge hitter that people always talk about is they like the topology view. Um, a topology view, meaning that I see my service architecture and what nodes are calling what, is a very intuitive way uh, for people to look at their networks. They don't want to look at 300 services. Nobody wants to see like a thing that's connecting to more than like a dozen things. <laughs> but um, to the degree that you can manage um, uh, a point of view, uh, it's it's an extremely uh, helpful. Um, you know, helpful to see see these these nodes, because the the diagrams are not something we can always draw statically. Now a lot of people can, but um, there are increasingly complex architectures out, right? And um, we're sort of um, wrapping up the intro section here, but like like the ne next thing people usually ask is how do I turn it on? And um, at, at the end of the day, there's libraries underneath that are recording the data. You'll, you'll see the word tracer pop up sometimes. It's like a metrics or logging library. And the main difference here is that this one is a stateful one because it needs to actually move this ID across. So not only does it need to carry the ID from like one side of your app to the other, but it needs to like stuff that ID into a header or something so that it can get to the next machine. And then that one can pick up and then move it onto the other side. So it's one of the more technically difficult um, like observation uh, libraries. Um, and uh, you'll sometimes see the word instrumentation. Instrumentation is not, um, is not actually specific to, to tracing. Um, it's, uh, you know, instrumentation just means that you, you have taken, taken something and uh, you are, you are uh, like collecting metadata and in, in our world of, of, of monitoring such, usually it's, it's getting timing information or, or pulling tags and things out of it. And so instrumentation can be for metrics, it can be for uh, tracing, sometimes they're the same code. But the idea here is that instrumentation would take something like your Apache HTTP client and then hook in at the right spots to know when the request started and when the request stopped. Because nothing is helpful unless you've got data coming out of it. And you have um, a coherent understanding about like what the start and stop stuff actually means. And um, at the end of the day, stuff needs to be configured. Um, some folks here, since we're at a Spring conference, probably seen uh, Spring Cloud Sleuth. If you haven't, that would be the, the configuration library for Spring Boot that, that puts this stuff together. Um, but like a, typically, an application performance management tool um, would you would also have other options like agents and things like that. And so there's some, some vocab. You see the word span. That's like a step. 
in the in the in the whole trace, which is a collection of those spans. And um, the secret sauce for how this stuff works uh, is that the small part, like the IDs, they're actually put inside of the HTTP request if it's an HTTP-based system or a gRPC request if it's a gRPC one. And, and they kind of add a little bit of weight to, to your request as they go along. Because not only are they carrying like the post or whatever that you're doing, but you're now putting another header on there. Now, you don't do it yourself. This stuff happens behind the scenes. But um, when we say in-band, what we mean is we're actually tagging that request with some IDs so that it knows what step it's in. And then um, all of the other data, like the timing information and tags saying, like, this is this Amazon instance ID or whatever else that you might uh, use to slice and dice later, that stuff's shipped asynchronously, meaning that that's not going to wait on your request. That's going to be sent, sent in like near real time. So for example, in a, in a Zipkin um, world, uh, which I'll get onto the next slide, usually people start to get impatient after a few seconds if they can't see a trace. So um, it's, it's usually not minutes. But then there are some sites that will put trace data inside the same pipelines as their log processing and stuff. And it might, might be delayed because of that. But um, there will be some small delay, uh, in other words, because it is, is, it is happening um, out of band. And so Zipkin is a, um, is a distributed tracing system. It's an open source um, project that originally started at, at Twitter. Uh, we've um, we've actually uh, brought it out, and the community has gone gone pr pretty big. And this is what a lot of this presentation will end up um, being about: is what the community are doing with the project. This is actually a real trace um, from a, uh, a company in, in Barcelona that does uh, this type form. They do like uh, online form building, and here you could see actually if you if you were reading it carefully, um, that you can't see it. I can't even see it. But anyway, there, one of the lines is red. So the funny thing was, was that this thing um, made three uh, SQL queries, um, but then the overall request failed. And one of the things that's nice is you can see that none of those SQL requests failed. So there was application logic failure there. And so once you get to the point where you can read these things, where we use the color red to d designate uh, an error, um, and, and the lack of that is usually success. <laughs> Um, then you can like pick into here and then quickly grok um, at, like where, where the error happened and, and other metadata that can help steer you towards a, a hopefully quicker conclusion. And it happens to be implemented in Spring Boot. Um, so our, our server is just a Java uh, server and, um, and then it has an API and stuff like that that's, that's available for use. But of course we, we package Docker containers and stuff like that. Uh, so they can be used in, in uh, you know, other environments. So now I'm going to get, I'm out of the intro section, I'm going to get into use cases because I feel like that's probably the most important part of this presentation versus like any given thing. But um, uh, actually, th this, is, uh, this is not me. <laughs> uh, this part is going to be done by uh, Tommy, who was actually a former site owner before he joined us in Pivotal and uh, has some interesting um, discussion about how you can use tracing in a non, uh, not just for production way. Thank you, Adrian. So yes, uh, tracing is not just for production. A lot of people use it to debug latency issues in production or to understand the flow of requests through their production systems. But there are other uses. Uh, and testing is one of these examples that I wanted to go through. And it, testing benefits from tracing for many of the same reasons that your production system will benefit from tracing. So specifically, I wanted to talk about some end-to-end -end testing and give an example here. And what I mean by end-to-end -end testing is some kind of scenario where you would issue requests the same way that a user would when using your system, or their browser would issue these requests. And so you have uh, multiple individual requests that are made. So you can see scenario one, update my order. You can imagine going and viewing all of your orders and then picking a specific one and then making some update to that. And the request might turn out like this, where you have a, you know, two gets and a patch, or cancel multiple multiple orders. And these are kind of end-to-end -end test scenarios that you might put together, and run. And if you look at the test output, it might look something like this, where you get pass fail for each one, and if it fails, you might have some additional information about it. But this might not be enough context to very quickly figure out 
why did this end-to-end -end test fail? So it, you know, it gives you the HTTP status. It'll give you the response issued to the end-to-end uh, -end test uh, harness that's actually running these. But you don't know underneath how many different services may have been involved in filling that request and in which one there was an issue. And you can see a second example there where tests may time out because you don't want your end-to-end -end tests to be running for forever because the user is not going to wait for forever. So this is an example of, say, a five-second timeout. And in that case, you're not going to actually even have the response to get additional data here. But if you're tracing these, we'll show that you can get some additional information about what happened and what went wrong. So the goals in goals or problems with maybe doing end-to-end -end testing without tracing is that it's difficult to identify which component in your distributed system is failing. And then, of course, you want to assign this test failure to that team so that they can look into what's wrong and fix the bug or tell you that it's not an issue because of some reason. And when you're doing these end-to-end -end tests across a distributed system, a lot of times there will be a dedicated QA team that makes these end-to-end -end tests. So it's not actually the service team that's running these tests because it may go across multiple services that are, multiple teams are in charge of. So the QA team may not know, OK, I got this error response like a user would get. What does that mean? Where does the issue actually lie? And so if you have tracing, you can get this kind of additional information. The second thing is, even if you have an error message and you have some idea of what's wrong, it's hard to correlate that to more detailed information like logs and tracing. You know this error happened when running this test at this time, and this is the initial call you made. But how do I get the logs specifically for that request that was sent? And this is something that tracing can help because you can look up things by IDs. So by adding tracing, I'm asserting that you can get improved end-to-end -end testing because you'll have a known trace ID associated with each request as part of your end-to-end -end testing. And on top of this, Adrian explained how a trace is made up of multiple spans. A lot of systems have a concept of a correlation ID, and this correlation ID could be associated with multiple traces. So in the testing scenario, you had a scenario that was made up of multiple individual requests. So each individual request would have its own trace ID. But that scenario could also have a correlation ID that associates those uh, individual requests. And so if you have these things, it's much easier to say, OK, this text, test execution happened. It failed at this part. Now give me the trace information for that specific request. Rather than traditionally, maybe the QA team says, OK, I failed when calling this. You look into it. That team goes to look into it. Oh, it's not us. We called this service. That failed. You go to that team. They give, tell you the same thing. And then eventually, you get somewhere. And they have to look it up by, OK, this test ran at this time. So check your logs around that timestamp. And this is something that happens a lot. But it's inefficient. And in a testing environment where you have a lot of requests happening at the same time, it's hard to be sure that the logs you're looking at actually correspond to that exact test ex execution. And so by adding tracing and being able to get to these by IDs, you can be much more accurate and quick about getting to the bottom of the issue. So if we took a look at that same sample run, but add in the idea, IDs that you could issue by tracing, you can see you'll have the correlation ID for the test run scenario, say in this case, run number 112. And then you'll have a trace ID for each individual request. And then maybe your topology looks something like this, where requests go through a gateway, goes to an order service that calls items and prices. And whatever test harness you're using to issue these requests, you would have it send tracing headers. So when you go to, when you start this test run, you decide, say, a correlation ID. And when you go to the first order, you're going to send tracing headers to say, this is the trace ID that I want to use for this request. This is the correlation ID I want to use for this request. And so then you already know the trace ID for this. So when you're looking at your logs for your end-to-end -end tests, you'll know this is the trace ID. So if I look up in my tracing system, I can get the exact trace for this run 
this uh, request. And just to note, if your uh, requests go through some kind of gateway or proxy, then you need to make sure that that gateway or proxy is forwarding those tracing headers or otherwise they won't actually reach the application and it won't be able to use that ID that you're trying to pass and propagate that along. So, and if in production, typically accepting uh, these trace headers from an untrusted user is not something that you want to do. You don't want to let untrusted users decide your, your tracing headers. But uh, if you use a VPN or proxy, these are ways that you could potentially even be able to use this in production. So now you have your sample output and you know that you have IDs for each scenario and for each individual request. And so you have that same information, like the HTTP status that was returned to the request. But now you can link it to your tracing system. So you could do something like add a link. And if you're using Zipkin, then you can search in Zipkin for a tag on the correlation ID and find all traces where the correlation ID tag equals this ID. And then you'll be able to get a list of traces that are associated to that correlation ID. And then for the individual requests that failed, you would be able to jump to Zipkin and look at that specific trace view. And you get that hierarchical structure and see the time that was spent in each uh, span and where any errors may have occurred. So this is a rough drawing of what it might look like in this uh, made up scenario where you have this end-to-end -end test and you're going to get the orders and on the second delete request to cancel an order, you get an error. So you see that the request is going from the gateway calling the order service, the order service is calling the item service, and then it's calling the pricing, and then it's calling items again. And on the second time it calls pricing, you see that box is red. So you know that there was some error that happened there and you can see that that's the request that caused the whole thing to fail. And so now you know what service the error uh, happened in first and then how that propagated back up. And so this helps you pinpoint things. And of course, if you're in the Zipkin UI and you click on any of these individual spans, you can get more meta information about that specific span. Things like specifically what HD path did it have, what response status was it, these kind of things. And if looking at this trace view doesn't give you enough information to um, figure out what the root cause is or what team you should ask to investigate this, you can also look up your logs. Because Adrian mentioned that uh, these trace IDs and span IDs can be used for correlating across systems like logging. So if you are outputting your trace ID and span ID to your logs and things like your service name, then you can easily jump from, okay, I'm looking at this trace ID, go to my logging system and look up all logs that have that trace ID. And so that way you can, you've now, you have your end test, end test running, you had a failure along there, you can look up exactly the trace of the request that failed, see where in your distributed system the failure started, and you can look at the logs that are associated with the whole trace request, or you can look specifically at the span that corresponds to the request that failed. So next, uh, another use case that I wanted to talk about was alerting and how you can use uh, tracing to improve your alerting. So alerts are usually based on aggregated metrics. Uh, how many people have alerts for their system? Great. How many people have tracing set up in their system? Awesome. So this is something that if you're not already, you could use tracing to improve your alerting. So alerts happen. Here are a couple examples of alerts. But then what do you do? What's, what are the steps that you take after you've received an alert? So these aggregated metrics that are the basis for these alerts are great for detecting issues and telling you uh, generally what's wrong. But then you need to drill down somehow and investigate, OK, what's specifically causing this uh, situation that raised an alert. So you see here, maybe you have a high error ratio. Some endpoint in a service is returning more errors than, than some threshold that you've set. 
And I think it's always a good idea if you have set up alerts for each alert that you have set up to have some kind of a playbook that says, okay, when this alert happened, these are the steps that you should take. Go to this system, look at that. But that doesn't mean that you can't make it easier to do that. And so these, you can see in these alerts, there's some metadata available there. So if we look at this, you can see the underlying portions are basically metric tags. So you have your time series data and there's some metadata associated with that. So for say the max high latency, sorry, high max latency alert, you can see that it happened in the order service. So that's metadata associated with this alert. You can see that it was a, an endpoint that was receiving get requests, what specifically was the endpoint for that. And you can see exactly what the uh, max latency was when this alert was fired. So this is all metadata that's in your metrics. Tracing also has a tag concept, which is metadata attached to tracing. And these two things can match. And especially if you're using Spring Cloud Sleuth and Micrometer, which Spring Boot uses for its metric system, then these values will typically match. And so in this way, you could add links to your alerts that are firing and very quickly jump to a dashboard to look at your metrics dashboard but then filter the dashboard to the specific context of this alert. So you know the alert is happening for the order service, you know it's happening for get requests. These are filters that you can put on your dashboard so that you can very quickly get to looking at graphs corresponding to that. But then what's really neat is if you have tracing, you're not just looking at the graph of aggregated across all of your requests. You can see examples of specific requests that fall under this criteria. So you could jump to Zipkin and search for all traces that were above 500 milliseconds in the order service for HTTP get requests for this endpoint. And then you would be able to look at specific requests that had this issue being reported by the alert. And of course you have to keep in mind sampling. Uh, tracing data is usually sampled, which means that the metrics data is acro aggregated across all requests, but tracing data being sampled, you may not find uh, any traces to correspond to this because they may not have been included in the sampled data. But if it's a consistently occurring uh, issue that's causing this alert, then likely you'll be able to find some kind of trace. And that is it for me on those use cases. So I will hand it over to back to Adrian to tell you about some typical sites that are using Zipkin. You thought that was helpful. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I, actually, I I, uh, I even learned some things there. Um, so uh, the next section is um, we actually have a um, a wiki page on our GitHub, which which I can share the link. I'll share the slides but have um, some sort of uh, site documents with some common questions and, and such that, that we ask of uh, users to provide. And uh, users usually will have a hard time providing this information because they usually have got to clear it with their you know, council and whatnot. Um, and uh, so it's really nice when people share their site setups because uh, everybody starts somewhere and, uh, and uh, people are at different steps in their journey. This particular part of the presentation is going to just overview um, several different types of sites um, and, um, and some of the way we, we, we collaborate together. So when I say site, I mean some sort of a used, like non-academic, non-laptop-based non deployment um, that, that basically considers Zipkin as instrumental in that. And, um, and I'll get into more why I'm using a more vague terminology, but, but mainly uh, the Zipkin community uh, is, is sort of community first. Um, we have a lot of different ways that we interact. Some are more interested in the instrumentation code and like, in like the boot apps or whatever. Some are more interested in the data pipelines and, and we'll go over how uh, different sites have different um, uh, values. We also have a, a jargon we toss around called site owner, 
And, and mainly, like, I mean, the ownership concept is like one of the most important things in technology. In in an open source community, ownership is also an extremely important thing. And and the liaison, or or in some cases, just like the dual roles that people play when they're when they're doing their jobs and they're spending like 10% time or, or whatever their time is to sort of bridge bridge these worlds of, of like my, what my, my company needs versus what, what's happening in open source com community. We usually use the word site owner to describe that role. And um, ma many of them, um, majority, are, are part-time. Um, so Zipkin is, is a setup that um, rarely has uh, a large staff unless it's a really big site. <laughs> And even then, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's usually um, rare to find a, a, a team, like a seven-person team. It's, it's not like your normal database team. It's usually like a side job or a part of a, a portfolio of monitoring tools and things. And then people have different responsibilities. And so personally, it will be quite frequently the case that someone who works in a Zipkin site may have like peaks of work. And they do some setup work, and they're do, very, real busy for a few months, and then it gets dormant for a while, and then sometimes uh, peaks again when frameworks are updated. But that's the general dynamics of of how um, Zipkin works. But um, yeah, these are a lot of text here. But but we try to collect things that that are relevant to things that were asked of us. So as a community, we uh, Zipkin does not have a lot of like full time help. I'm a, I'm a full time person. Uh, we have uh, one full-time uh, UI person who, is, who uh, uh, works at a company called Line, but most, most everything is volunteer. And so we just don't have um, the infrastructure to do a lot of re repetitive Q&A and, and stuff like that. With like Our chat channel has 2,000 in it, I think, at this point. <laughs> and so you need to be able to inventory common questions and, and concerns. And we found that the best way to to match that is that most people are looking for relevant information about what what they're going to do, and so if we spread that out and we find that you know there's there's some context needed, say is this a, is this a setup that's like me or should I just ignore it? Um, so uh, and then um, what types of things are involved in the system? Is it is it like you know just Java apps or is it just Python or, or what what is the complexion of the network um, that that's that's worked on? And um, the people don't talk about it a lot. Um, data conventions are really important in, in any of the, the, the uh, you know, monitoring systems. If you don't have good um, keys that relate to your business, it can be hard to, to pull relevant data out of the system. And so we try to talk about some things like that. Um, and increasingly, people are, you know, are conscious of things like cost, especially in the world of like monitoring solutions. Sometimes things can be quite expensive. So uh, we've recently been surprised to find people actually telling us how much things cost. And we're like, hey, OK, great. We'll share that too. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a nice grab bag of information, we hope. So like some of the first things are like, um, back when I started on, on the Zipkin project, it was 2015, I, I had been, I just walked into it from a random other part of, of, the, of uh, the company. and. Um, uh, one of the things I noticed in the community was that people were spending a lot of time setting up tracing, and they weren't quite sure how to even phrase the value of what they're doing. And so um, even if they got their manager to like, let them loose for, for a couple of months to like, do this thing, um, it was very hard for people to even phrase what their expected value would be out of this thing when they, when they finished. And that's one of the reasons why some of the slides we're talking about, like why do I care type of things. It's kind of inf important information. So some, some of the things that I, that I personally like, picked out of the, the bucket of, of, uh, of wikis was um, um, Ascend, which is a financial services company in, in, uh, in Thailand. Um, what they found that was the, uh, the key thing uh, was um, actually they're in this digital transformation thing like a lot of folks are. And there's a lot of conjecture out there. Like, this is going to solve everything, right? And so one of the things that you can do to keep yourself honest is actually measure before and after. <laughs> and so if you look at things like, I'm doing some service refactoring. This is async. It's going to be awesome. You could actually do things like look at these uh, the traces before and after and actually see if they're actually scheduled more efficiently now that you're using like flux and things. And um, that was one of the things that they thought was, was a nice way to provide more um, 
transparency in, into the, the work that engineers are doing. Um, because the diagrams aren't, aren't that hard to, 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 to grok. The other thing is, is that um, uh, service communication. We have a lot of folks who are looking at API gateway patterns or mesh and all these other things. We're all supposed to be traffic cops and controllers and everything. But then, you know, these are apps run by devs and they can just connect to anything, right? So you could actually see uh, non-conformance uh, service communication. To the degree that's a problem is up to you and your environment if this is actually relevant or, or, or if it's just like, a, you know, something to, to know about. But, um, but these are interesting things, like where, what's, the, what's the convergence of the actual you know, code versus the design that people expected it to have. Hotels.com was mostly looking at how to get these low-hanging fruit there. Um, uh, you know, once you have identified the sort of like worst offenders, which is hopefully targeted at code, not people, um, but um, you know, see, allow other people to to view and, and ones who, are, who have a little bit more experience in parallel um, to to sort of give a, a nice uh, overview of, of an opinion um, that that has some relevance to actual production requests. So the nice thing is is that these these diagrams are are kind of like a way that you can talk with uh, various parties. They're not too language centric, in other words. So if you see service calls happening from here, here, and here you'll probably be hard pressed to tell that it's even Java if, if, you're, if it is even Java. And so that one of the nice things about that is that it allows more people to participate in the discussion. Um, Netflix will, will, will let um, Nara talk more, but I thought this was a really succinct statement. <laughs> and if we had this back in 2015, I think we would have had a much easier time. But um, you know, there's, there's a lot packed into this sentence. Um, operational visibility, developer productivity. What are you optimizing for, right? Like what was your what's your uh, what is your asset in your environment? Is it is it uh, is it making people's time higher leverage? And I, and I think that's that's a nice thing if, if uh, tracing is working out in that in that department. Um, infrastructure. A lot of people ask me about the infrastructure that's needed in a tracing system. One of the things I'd like to re remind is that the tracing architecture is actually all of it uh, because. Uh, if data doesn't enter the system, it's not a very useful system. And there's, there's components like in the Spring Boot world, Sleuth is the thing that configures the tracing. If that's not actually working, um, then uh, you know, it can actually break traces and stuff like that. So, so really the, the data comes from your apps themselves. We use the, the word instrumented apps to, do, to distinguish the difference between something that's actively participating in tracing versus something that's maybe like a MySQL client, where MySQL itself is not instrumented in reporting stuff. So when you look at the service topologies that um, any of the tools out there will draw, they usually have this sort of like, here's all the stuff that we know is happening, and, and then you get to like the cloud, like where, whether it's like making a call into Amazon, and maybe that point, that part of Amazon isn't instrumented. Actually, now Amazon itself is tracing uh, a lot more often. but. Um, but basically, you have a, a, an overlay of the things that are actually collecting data and, and sending it into the system and things that, that are not participating. And, and um, in fact, you can use Zipkin itself to, to report status on your tracing because the, the, the depth of the topology that it can draw is directly related to the data that's being reported into it. And so some people are actually looking at like the diagrams on a, like a month-to-month -month basis and seeing that, okay, well, now we have 50 apps before it was only 30. And uh, so these, these sorts of things are, are, are kind of neat side effects. But um, what I meant to focus on this slide for architecture is, is that sites, sites have different architectures. Um, you have different components. Um, you really want, just like your normal software architecture, you don't want a big mismatch between what um, the developers are using or, or what your, your data team are capable of operating. And, and what your tracing system is, is, is using. Um, so for example, if, if you're uh, very good at Elasticsearch, then you probably would prefer to use Elasticsearch for your, your data backend. If, you're, if, you're, um, if you prefer using uh, RabbitMQ to, to send other things around, maybe you would choose RabbitMQ to send the, the tracing data around. But, but mainly, like, look at the intersection between your skill set and what's available and, and make that choice. And so that actually ends up meaning that a Zipkin site could actually be um, 
uh, running different things, um, they may not even run Zipkin's server itself. Um, so for example, there's just like normal application architecture, there's some things that can be done in a SaaS fashion um, and uh, integrated setups that don't mean you, um, you're actually running everything in house. So for example, one site uh, uses like a Google stack driver for the tracing thing and just the, the apps report directly. And so like there's a Spring Cloud GCP project, for example, that automatically configures that. Um, Hotels.com actually, um, they have an agent that actually can send things into a different um, tracing backend called Haystack. Even though um, they're using the same um, Spring Cloud SLU, they can still send data into a different system that they, their central system they run in-house. And then when I say hybrid, I, I mean like, like advanced setups. Like one of the things that Yelp does is they, they have like a, a short amount of time where they collect all of the data. We call it like a firehose mode. In addition to, uh, you know, sampled at a low percentage for all requests. And um, that, that specialized system coexists um, with, with a normal Zipkin system. And um, yeah, and also like what libraries are in the apps will be different in some cases. So for example, as long as things are compatible from like a header standpoint and the data output standpoint, that's the most important thing. Uh, and the quality of that data is, is, is extremely important. Um, uh, what can be then less important is what, how, you, how you get the data. So um, you know, if, if at the end of the day, um, you, you have a successful system at some point um, you, you get to a point of an analysis um, where, where this data is actually helping you in, in different ways. And the, the most important part there is, is the quality, uh, um, not necessarily how it's, how it's, uh, how it's scraped. And um, you know, we've had sites that actually were like all in on Zipkin and then changed. So for example, Hotels.com, you know, which is part of the Expedia group, were originally like using uh, Zipkin instrumentation and also Zipkin backend, but um, Expedia have this this really robust new uh, Kafka streams based architecture thing called Haystack, and that's their central service. And so um, they actually have a, uh, a component that just pushes the data straight into there. So the apps have no idea that it's not using Zipkin, <laughs> um, and, and their their central team has has like a, a, a different. Uh, service, but because Zipkin is, is a, just a jar file, um, their their devs can run it on their laptop and just hit Java minus jar Zipkin, and then and then test their apps, and and uh, they don't need to to care so much uh, as as long as uh, uh, the data is is still reported the same way. I'm going to let um, Nara talk more about uh, Netflix. Um, they they definitely just as an overview. Um, Netflix has been doing tracing for quite a while. Uh, probably they started around the same time Twitter did uh, in the early 2010s. And uh, so they had, uh, they had actually multiple tracing systems. And one of the goals is to converge that so that you have higher, higher leverage out of this collected data. So you're not just like having the everything in Splunk problem, which I've heard many people talk about. Um, and uh, so he's got some interesting things to talk about that, not about Splunk. And, um, and then, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, we have sites that, that actually never used the server, but uh, use, all, use a lot of our libraries. Um, and so, for example, if you're, a, if you're a startup or you have a low traffic uh, site, you may find that just using like Amazon X-Ray or, or, or Stackdriver or something is, is going to be a low um, friction way uh, to do things. If you're already deploying Java, it's probably not that hard to deploy like a, a, a Zipkin jar. But um, there are certainly uh, sites that, that can make different choices, and we're happy they can make them. Um, to get more you know, away from like, the edge cases and more into like, the, the easy cases, uh, uh, Metadata is, a, is a, a company that's a, uh, lar the largest provider of software for clinical uh, medical trials. And they're a total Amazon infrastructure, and they just basically take our image and throw it into ECS and let it do its thing. Uh, they pointed to uh, uh, Amazon's managed Elasticsearch service. So um, this is, uh, and because they don't have a lot of traffic, like that's one thing, like a lot of times people get like overemphasized on scale and, the, and not, not all apps actually translate into like massive amounts of requests per second. And so um, sampling is when you're collecting less than 100% of requests because 
collecting all of them would, would cost too much. But if you're only getting you know, several requests per second or something like that, it may be perfectly fine to collect everything and it'd be easier for you. So in their case, they, they're just collecting everything because it's, it's, uh, it doesn't cost them anything. Um, and so the, uh, uh, the only thing they did that was like non-standard is they, they, they know that the data is going into Elasticsearch. They know they can create aggregations and tools um, based on that. So they decided to use this to help um, communicate um, service level agreements and, and in, a, in a cute way, basically to make like name and shame reports for who's actually violating whose SLAs. And these reports are called SLAP reports. So um, it's, it's, it's really like a stock plus plus Zipkin instrumentation because they have like a side app that um, makes this the SLAP report. And what it would do, and you can't really see here, but it will show you the percentage of your requests that are conformant to your SLA that you defined. And then it would have representative traces of the ones that weren't. And so you could easily use that to just narrow straight down and then like continue this discussion about why the SLA breach happened and whether or not it was important. So, um, so these are just some examples here. And besides architecture, um, wildly different um, ideas on, on what type of uh, retention is used and uh, how, how many tags to put on your data. So like we have ways to to decide what, what type of tags, and there may be some business level tags. So like in, in uh, Spring Cloud Sleuth, you could actually wire in a, a, an interface called Span Customizer and put like your own tag if you have something with a very low risk interface. So it's not going to like be incompatible, like the interface hasn't changed in years. And um, so that you can, you can do something in order to, um, to make things more, more like you. So for example, we have autocomplete support for uh, certain fields that you would whitelist. So in the company line, they, have, they don't use the word environment at their shop. They use a word called phase. And, and there are certain types of data conventions that will be mildly different from site to site. And there's no point trying to like, have a system and say, like, in order to use the system, you have to change your company's vocabulary. Like, that's not an easy win. So um, we have some features to allow some, th some like, mild uh, customizations to, to help um, with that. Um, I mentioned about the data retention. There's different sample rates and stuff like that. And of course, the biggest thing that's that's wildly different. And when you should when you're talking to people, which who are the people that wrote this stuff? They're they're real people. You can you can just join in the chat room and talk to them. Um, is the adoption levels? Like everybody's at different phases, and there's almost never not no, it's never really a hundred percent of anything in in tech, right? So you can find people that are in like maintenance mode. And it seems like as you approach 90%, you're probably in maintenance mode <laughs> because there's never 100%. Um, and uh, and that, that's a, uh, it's, a good, it's a good indicator, especially if you're trying to get a confidence level of a certain type of decision to know how far along, how, how old the site is and stuff like that. So um, this, this gets to the end of this, this part before I hand it over to Nara. A lot of people's question is like, how, how would I actually get started? And, and a better, better way to respond to that is how are people getting started? And there's really a few archetypal patterns. Um, I mean, Greenfield, we don't really need to explain. People know that like, if you have a new set of apps, then they can basically do whatever they want. That's why people like, try to gravitate towards that stuff. Um, but one of the funny things that Hotels.com were saying, and I heard this a few times, was that um, while it's distributed, even starting with one app is helpful because they can still see the ins and outs of their app. They can see the, the communication coming in and the communication coming out, and that's better than nothing, and it's cheap. So if you, if you have no idea where to start, starting with one is not a terrible choice. Um, you'll get higher leverage out of a proxy because you'll get more in, you know, in and outs there, whether that's a gateway or, or actually a proxy type of technology. Um, but um, but uh, uh, probably the most common way that people end up with tracing is they, they have some sort of framework that has tracing built in, like, like uh, Spring Cloud Sleuth, and that sort of just weeds its way through the environment. So now uh, move from a typical Zipkin sites to a typical Netflix site. <laughs> and uh, Naira has uh, actually flown out here. It was real nice to, to come out just for today to, to uh, chat on stage with us. So, so thanks very much. And, over to you. Thanks, Adrian.
Hello. Um, so first I would start with, uh, you know, why do we trace at Netflix? So these are the, some of the use cases. Um, like first one is like troubleshooting in production. Uh, it's basically, uh, you know, latency analysis and then also looking at application behaviors. Um, like for example, uh, like for one of our migration project, like moving from one stack to another stack. So we want to understand how the call patterns are. Uh, that's one. And then also to help the customer support uh, like for example, 4K video is not playing in my device, like why it is not playing, like you know, what service um, is not behaving the way it should be. So troubleshooting is in production is a key thing. Um, I'll talk about sampling uh, later because that is related to that. Um, and uh, we also use tracing uh, to understand the application uh, behavior for our chaos experiments. Um, meaning like when uh, chaos experiments, like failures are injected in the services. Uh, with the failures injected, uh, the app owners can like look at the trace and understand how the uh, services behaved. Were, were there were any retries? Uh, did it take the correct fallback path, and so on? So looking at a trace, like you can really uh, you know understand like how the request was served. So chaos experiments are done in production, and uh, tracing helps us understand uh, for the app owners uh, to understand the application behaviors. So we use tracing data also for um, doing A-B tests, like when new features are introduced, uh, the app owners, they want to understand like, now what is the service impact? Like I'm introducing a new feature, it's gonna call a service, but if that service is calling, like uh, going to call another 300 services downstream, like giving a holistic view uh, to the app owner uh, that, okay, so you're making a call to this one service, but then it is gonna make like several other calls. And um, so it, it helps them understand like what is the impact for a new feature that is getting developed. Um, the tracing data is also useful uh, for deciding uh, like how the traffic should be routed to uh, like uh, one region, like how much capacity should be given to a service or not. So we, uh, the tracing data is helpful to like understand this uh, because we capture like the device type in every span. So with that, uh, we can understand the service, like how much demand for a device type um, is there for a service. So with that breakdown, they're able to like route traffic to uh, um, regions and provision the services uh, accordingly. So these are some of the uh, use cases. Um, like, so, okay, what do we need to satisfy those use cases? Um, like going with the like build was by decision, say what we need is really a tracing platform that is flexible uh, to satisfy the current use cases and also uh, the future needs, uh, which means like we want uh, extensibility in all parts of tracing, like trace collection, transportation, stream processing, storage, and then uh, big data processing. So we need that programmability in the entire pipeline. So what we really wanted is a tracing platform. So the question is like, no, is tracing new for Netflix? No, so we did develop a homegrown solution based on uh, Dapper around the same time Zipkin started 2013. Um, that is still used because tracing systems are hard to <clears throat> you know, switch. So once you have things in production, it is very, very difficult to change. So that is still being used. And we also have a custom tracing solution developed for a different purpose, but that is used in, <clears throat> you know, in certain services. So this introduces a problem, like it introduces fragmentation. Now we have like, you know, multiple tracing systems uh, and it is traced multiple times. Like why do you want to trace a request multiple times? Um, so that's something, um, you know, that we're trying to avoid. So moving forward, how are we taking this up? Uh, Spring Boot adoption um, uh, is getting started. So for any uh, new Java service that is that will be <coughs> that will be developed for um, Netflix, it's it will be based on Spring Boot. Um, so Zipkin with Sp uh, uh, Spring Slo Cloud Sleuth, it has good integration. Um, so we want to leverage open source f uh, as much as possible for trace collection. So as services are built using uh, Spring Boot, um, so uh, the trace data is collected using Zipkin library natively. Uh, 
So how does this work with our legacy tracing system? So the strategy that uh, we have been taken is we will roam and write both the systems, um, the old system and the new one. And the old system would emit uh, data um, uh, in the legacy format. Uh, all Spring Boot apps would emit native Zipkin format. The data is converted um, in the backend, like as the data flows through. And also the IDs are updated so that um, uh, proper traces built. Otherwise, we have like two trace for the same uh, request from two different tracing systems. So we do that uh, stitching in the backend. Uh, so when the user looks at uh, a trace, so they, they are not aware of all the fragmentation. So we take care of this by uh, fixing the, the data in the backend as it flows through. So this is our pipeline. So on the top, you will see our legacy tracer. Um, we send it to Kafka, that, is, that will change eventually. Um, we want to avoid uh, you know, the data hitting the disk as much as possible so that we can, um, uh, you know, uh, like if you want to enable, like if you want to support 100% uh, sampling like if, to deal with that. So we, we want to avoid like uh, data go hitting the disk as much as possible. But in the current implementation, uh, the, the legacy tracer sends it to Kafka and the Zipkin also goes through Kafka. And we use Flink for uh, stream processing. Uh, we store the data in Elasticsearch, and also it goes to our iceberg. That's our big data uh, format, it's similar to Hive. Um, and we use the open source uh, Zipkin UI as such because we uh, convert the data to like Zipkin um, standard data and store it in Elasticsearch. So we have deployed Zipkin UI, and we have pointed to uh, pointed the Zipkin UI to our own Elasticsearch cluster. So that's how we are able to leverage the open source UI without any changes. We also have our own API for our uh, some special use cases that we have. So quick uh, note about sampling. So sampling is a key thing in tracing. Uh, with 0.1% sampling, like with high traffic uh, sites like Netflix, um, we cannot sample everything. Uh, so 0.1% sampling is what we have uh, for high traffic services. Uh, but we also have you know, on-demand sampling. So given a device ID uh, or given a customer ID, we, we enable 100%. We have the capability to enable 100% sampling, and we uh, control this via rules. So this helps an application owner, they can deploy those rules uh, for a period of time, capture traces, and analyze those traces. Um, and that, that's another strategy we follow. And the third one is secondary sampling, which we are working with um, the Zipkin community. Thanks, Adrian, for all the help. Um, so the, uh, it's still work in progress, but the idea is to be able to start and stop anywhere in the graph. Like if you have 300 services, I want to be able to start somewhere in the like third level, but capture only my immediate downstream, uh, but sample at 100% and so on. So that will be like super powerful for us. Uh, and uh, the last sampling uh, strategy that we uh, use is for low traffic services, like all the services that we have developed for um, the studio automation. Uh, so those, the number of requests is like very, very low. So for low traffic services, we always capture 100%. So that's all I have. Uh, Adrian, back to you. I think Q and A time. Yep. Thanks, yeah. So yeah, we're uh, Q and A time. So feel free to raise your hand. I guess we got about five five minutes. And we also have two more folks from our <laughs> team, <laughs> Taylor, Asi. They can also answer tra tracing questions or Spring Boot questions also. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you happy you sat in the front? Yeah. So yep. as Adrian said, we'll make the slides available later. So we have a link to site docs so you can see different people, different systems that are using Zipkin and details about what kind of deployment they have, how many people work on Zipkin, what it's the cost. And then also we have contact information if you want to reach us by chat. We have a Gitter channel and there's our main repository. If you like Zipkin, please give us a star. <laughs> Good. So any questions? Yeah, so um, if you don't, what would happen is you'd only see the client side when you're making a call outwards. And so um, when I mentioned about the, so the question was like, um, 
if if I'm if I'm getting started um, and I and I have like like say I'm using Sleuth or something like that, if that's installed inside of one of my apps, um, what would happen? If if it only is on one, then you would see like how long that side you know is spent on the server and for each of the client requests going out, but it wouldn't know how long the next hop uh, spent in that server, so you wouldn't get the the full story. You would get some information, and so um, basically. What you want are traced paths, meaning that uh, if you have uh, two, two nodes, you'd want the one in front of the other one, and those both enabled, and then, and then branch out like that, because then uh, the paths are you know, going to be uh, telling you both the client and the server side. If, if tracing is turned on sporadically, what would happen is it would, it would not work very well, because uh, it start here. Nothing in between. Uh, the next one is like, oh, I don't see any trace header. I'm going to start a trace again, <laughs> and then and then you just have a bunch of a bunch of data that um, that would uh, um, be harder to to parse. So is the question, how do you correlate trace IDs to another system like logging? So. Yeah, something like that. Is it like, is there any best practices or pattern that you use? Yeah, so it, it depends what you're using for your logging system. So if you're using Elasticsearch and you're indexing based on the trace ID in there, then you can easily write a search for, say, Kibana, which is the UI usually used with Elasticsearch, and you can so then on your Zipkin server, you can configure a URL that has a placeholder for the trace ID. And so that logs button that will appear on the UI when you're looking at a trace will just fill in the trace ID for the trace that you're looking at in that URL. And so you just click on it, and that would take you to Kibana with a pre-populated search for that trace ID. And you can do similar things with other logging systems as long as you can index on that trace ID and make a URL that searches for it. And we don't have an automatic root cause analysis tool, I think was part of your question, too. There, there's not currently, at least in the open, at least that I'm aware of, we don't have something that will try to, 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 to root it out. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. Than, than, than what he said. Yeah, this, this link here, which we'll send out, um, some people have, have actually put examples of what, what type of keys they use. And they're, they're, they're going to be like the most relevant keys are the better, and, and also ones that are not infinite. <laughs> so like you don't want UIDs and things like that. What's the question? So in the, the question was about not trusting, not accepting tracing headers from untrusted clients. And the reason is because if you allow untrusted clients to just send tracing headers, then they can choose the trace IDs. And so they could do weird things like use the same trace ID for every request. And that will ruin your tracing data. But, Uh, well, so typically you would have some kind of gateway or something that generally doesn't forward those trace headers to the backend services that it's calling. Just in, in general, you wouldn't want to accept random headers from from the internet. When you say client side tracing, you're talking about devices like like Android and yeah. So. Um, the folks who are, who are doing that stuff, uh, basically, you already have some sort of authenticated channel. Uh, and so you have the op option to proxy mount just the like, upload path of the Zipkin data uh, to there. But I think that uh, a holistic architectural pattern is not there. But, but if, 
But if you get to a point where you trust communication, uh, or you trust the app, and, you, and you, you know that this one came from some pin cert that you, you then trust, it's, it's not necessarily the uh, not trusting the person. It's just like whether the way the ID is created is, is, is reasonable. <laughs> so if you, if you actually sign and seal the app, and you, you provision it, and it came from one of your pin certs, then you will have authenticated the binary. And then you can you could trust the binary if it's communi communicating to you on a, sec on a secure channel. So it's more or less just a common problem that would be if, if, if you had someone who is just like using curl or like trying to DDoS your system by sending the trace ID one constantly or something. So, so it's more, more about that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what we do have one or two like uh, example projects for things like angular tracing and stuff too. Um, but it's one of the least explored. Uh, we're out of time. Uh, so we can we can talk outside too. Thanks all for coming. Yeah, thank you.